Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining today um, for this brown bag lunch seminar for Nutritious Agriculture by Design, a tool for program planning. We're very pleased to have our um, eminent panel of experts here. Um, we actually scheduled this for February, but it um, inadvertently it had coincided with uh, the World Bank Sustainable Development Week where all of the agriculture people were going to be in training. So we specifically rescheduled because we really wanted um, to give opportunity to, especially to the agriculture um, people, to be able to hear this, what we think will be a very valuable um, presentation. Um, my name is Yuria Tanimichi Hoberg. I work on the Secure Nutrition Knowledge Platform <laughs> together with, and I'm from the Agriculture Department of the Bank, together with Leslie Elder here, who is uh, the Nutrition Cluster Leader at the Bank, and also with um, our poverty, manage, poverty Reduction and Economic Management Department, who focus on the metrics. We're very pleased. I don't want to take up any more of your time, so I'm going to pass the chair of this meeting to um, Bonnie McLafferty and uh, ask Bonnie to take it from here. Thank you very much for joining. Thanks, Yuri. Um, yes, hello everyone. So my name is Bonnie McLafferty. I'm the Director of Agriculture and Nutrition at GAIN, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. Um, just I would like to start by maybe providing the context so we're all kind of on the same page on this gap and this challenge we face trying to link these two sectors. Uh, and we know that many factors are contributing to the inability of people to consume nutritious and adequate diets and the body to absorb them effectively. But we also th know that there's no single solution has proven to be effective and that we need to actually layer several in any context. And among the multiple interventions are the food-based interventions um, and where they can play a particular role in addressing nutritional deficiencies, not only for those um, populations that have access to diets um, through markets, but also for those living in the rural areas. We also know that the undernourished, a huge portion of the undernourished live in rural areas and actually use farming and agriculture as their, um, for their livelihoods. So, Food-based approaches to reducing undernutrition focus on the, people's, on the ability of people to gain access to nutritious foods in which agriculture and agricultural food value chains play a key role. Yet interest in how to implement effective agriculture nutrition interventions that leverage increases in agricultural production to bring about improvement in nutrition and health is far from new. I look around the room and I see many of us who've looked at the, who've lived among this nexus of ag nutrition and I won't date myself but some of us have been doing this for quite some time. Um, remembering the work of uh, Per Pinstrup Anderson, Joachim von Braun, you know, we've, this ag nutrition linkage has been around for quite some time. Uh, overall improvements in agricultural productivity, what we've learned alone, does not seem to translate to improvements in nutrition. Specifically, whilst agricultural growth is strongly associated with improved caloric intake, the link to dietary diversity is less strong and the linkage to improve micronutrient status. So let's fast forward to the Feed the Future initiative, um, which was designed to accelerate inclusive growth in agriculture um, with improved nutritional status. This was quite innovative, and as well as bringing in the market-based approaches and using markets to drive and pull nutrition interventions based on foods. So as Feed the Future was growing, so this is still part of the context, as Feed the Future was growing, there was a need for a tool to help link these two sectors and it became very clear. Feed the Future put a challenge in front of agriculturalists and said you need to start thinking about nutrition and need to measure yourself on nutritional outcomes. And nutrition was saying, yeah, but you know, do we have the indicator? We're not really about food systems. So it, was, it remains, it was and remains quite a challenge. So this whole idea of, of working within the agricultural frameworks to provide a nutrition lens is where we are today with this tool. This is not saying we're starting from a nutrition, we're starting from agriculture. Agriculture works within value chains. So is there anything we can do where agriculture is already working to modify that agricultural value chain to improve nutrition? So today we're launching the tool. A little bit of background on the tool. When I came to GAIN two years ago, it was my first charge to try to build some sort of tool to work with Feed the Future. So um, 
we were given access to, fortunately, to the Feed the Future program as it was growing, and we validated this tool as it was being designed in both Kenya and Bangladesh using actual projects that fit within the Feed the Future portfolio. Um, and though it was developed for Feed the Future, it's been consciously designed to be a public good. So it's going to help all program managers really try to take a look at where they may be considering, where they could consider nutrition a little bit better as they move along the value chain with their projects. I'd like to introduce Professor John Humphrey for the from the Institute for Development Studies at the University of Sussex. John has been our partner in crime in developing this <laughs> and testing it all over the world. Thank you for coming, John, for today. <coughs> Um, the, the tool itself, um, uh, many of you had heard or had seen it, it under development and actually contributed to it. The Fanta program actually was quite um, helpful in looking at some of the earlier versions, but it's evolved since then considerably. Uh, we then use the tool actually with practitioners and designers in Tanzania, very hands-on. How can they tweak their programs or redesign them to be more nutrition friendly? And um, it has also been presented at various USAID training events for USAID project managers all around the world in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So the order of business today will be, John, I'm going to introduce you, and if you don't mind presenting the tool. Um, and then what we, we have at our table Jay Danilik with USAID, Bureau of Food Security. Jay will be able to tell us a little bit about how USAID finds this useful or where you intend to do with it in the future. Um, and then we also have at the table, Graham Dixby. Dixie? Dixie. Yes. Dixie. Yeah. Okay, hi, Graham. Um, who can also then extrapolate, well, where could this fit within the World Bank, and mm -hmm. would this be something that's practical? Now, the way the tool has been developed, you'll see it's electronic. It gets summarized at the end. You'll, you'll get a printout of, of all of the summary of where um, one can perhaps tweak agricultural programs to be more nutritious. But it also provides an opportunity for you to give us feedback. It's a living tool. And until more and more of us use it, it will be refined over time. So you'll see built into the design of the tool itself is an opportunity to refine it as we all try to um, meet this challenge of linking agriculture and nutrition. So John, if I can hand it over to you. After John's presentation, we'll open it up to questions, and then I have a series of um, other, other questions I may want to interject with the crowd. Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. It's a pleasure to be here at Secure Nutrition. And uh, as Bonnie says, uh, we've developed a tool to try to integrate better agricultural nutrition so that agricultural projects become more nutrition sensitive. And Bonnie has gave, given me a name check. I should also mention the name of my colleague Spencer Henson at IDS, who's also been working on this tool. And uh, we had to fight to decide which of us would... Um, be able to come to, to Washington for this presentation. I won't say whether the winner is here or still in Brighton. <laughs> uh, you can think about that yourself. Right. Um, so the goal of this tool is to prompt the redesign of existing agricultural projects to improve their nutrition impact. Equally, it's to enhance the specifications for new products. I think probably the greatest gain is at the project design stage. So rather than negotiating with implementers to persuade them to start doing things differently, it's probably be better to start with the right specifications and then use the tool as a way of establishing those specifications in the design stage of a project. And as Bonnie has said, we've tested this on, uh, um, verified it on USAID projects in Kenya and Bangladesh, and we've uh, worked with USAID uh, people in uh, Tanzania and elsewhere, and so we've, we've spent some time interacting with people uh, with this project. So the users of the project um, are project program designers and implementers. They don't have to be, it will be a, a public good available to, uh, on, on the game website for download by anybody that uh, wishes to use it. And the idea of the tool is that it can be used independently by these designers and implementers. So it's not, they don't have to ask GAIN to apply it or to work with them. They can use it in, uh, in, in the ways that they see fit. And I think that uh, given that specification, we felt that we had to produce a product that was straightforward and that could be used by agricultural specialists without assuming that those people had uh, specialist expertise in nutrition. 
So we wanted to get to an audience that didn't come from the nutrition, with the nutrition lens already, and then engage with them through the tool in order to raise questions about nutrition that they would be able to answer. And I think that, uh, that affects quite decisively the, the nature of the tool. So the tool doesn't say, for example, um, does, your, does your project, is your project likely to um, uh, lead to increased um, nutritional uh, intake or be better, better nutritional outcomes for the, uh, the families or households that are targeted by the tool? It says, have you asked that question? Have you sought out evidence? What is the evidence base on which you would be able to make that type of statement? It's actually very similar. I, I, it's a rather special, special area. Um, it's, it's rather similar to the way that um, standard schemes in agriculture are developed. It's about have you, have you followed through certain procedures? Have you adopted, uh, have you asked certain questions and have you looked for certain sources of information and validation to, to justify the statements you want to make about the, the output of a project? So it's, um, it doesn't uh, assume extensive nutrition expertise. It's self-assessment. If people want to use this tool and delude themselves into thinking that their, their project is perfectly aligned with nutrition interests, we can't stop them doing it. So we, the, because there's no exter we're, not, we're not asking for an external validation which would require <coughs> specialist expertise and extra resources. If people want to use this tool in the right way, they can. But if they want to waste their time using it in the wrong way, there's not a lot we can do about it. And we never designed, designed it so that we would be able to stop that. But we hope that if you ask people questions, then some of the questions follow up. So if there's a question, for example, that says, do you have any evidence that the target populations are actually deficient in the nutrients that you're hoping to deliver to them in greater quantities? They can say yes or no. If they say yes, we then say, what is that evidence? So at least there's one further step to say, okay, you think that, yeah, it must be true, but how do you know? So it's those types of questions that start to force people to interrogate the assumptions and the, uh, the principles that inform their own projects. As Bonnie has said, it's an online tool, and we try to provide pointers for further action. So, so I'll, I'll come to this uh, later in a moment. I should outline uh, three further points about the tool. Firstly, as Bonnie said, we're particularly interested in uh, agricultural projects and the consumption by target households of nutrient-dense foods. And the reason for that, I think, is the, uh, the continuing concern about high levels of micronutrient uh, under, under nourishment and the fact that it's well documented that the, the, that the, the cause and effect chain from improvements in agricultural productivity, uh, improvements in household incomes, to reductions in micronutrient under nutrition is particularly weak, that that link is relatively weak, and therefore that's the, that was the challenge that uh, we posed. Um, the second uh, point is that we, uh, we adopt a value chain approach, and I'll come on to where I think that in the tool this, is, this uh, uh, adds some value. And thirdly, um, although a lot of agricultural interventions are focused on farm households and the beneficiaries and the, the impact on, on, on the beneficiaries, we also consider the issue of nutritional benefits to none not, sorry, uh, it says non-farm households. What we mean is non-beneficiary households. They may be farm households that are not part of the, the, that are not the targets of the particular agricultural intervention. And I'll, I'll come on to that again uh, in a few minutes. Uh, just to give you a, an idea of what the tool looks like, uh, this, is, uh, this is the beginning of one of the sections of the tool. Don't try to read it. I'm worried about your eyesight. Um, and so it starts off with a question. Uh, in this particular question, the, the answer could be yes or no. If it's yes, you go to, what, you go to another question. If you, go to, if you say no, then it goes to a, a different question, and you follow through the tool, and you, you only answer the questions that are um, uh, relevant for the, for, for the way in which you work through the tool. Um, and uh, as Bonnie says, this is, uh, this is a living tool, and we hope to develop it from the experience of people applying it. Right, so we're particularly concerned with pathways from agriculture to nutrition, three pathways. I think the first two will be fairly familiar to you. So this first one that uh, we call the uh, consumption pathway. 
That's to say that uh, we have agricultural interventions that are increasing production and consumption of nutrient-dense foods, and one of the challenges for making, putting an, a nutrition lens on that type of intervention is how do we ensure that more of that food is consumed by the, the farm household and that the nutritional status of people in that household uh, uh, benefits from that. So we, so we look at the, the on-farm consumption route. Um, second, we have the increased, we have the, the income pathway, sorry, I keep, should say pathway rather than route. Uh, we have the income pathway. Most agricultural projects own, uh, aim to increase purchases of nutrient-dense foods. How is that working through to, incre to, to some of that increased um, so, so some of that increased income uh, ac actually translating into uh, either investments in, in the production of nutrient-dense foods like homestead gardens and the rest, or uh, through purchases on the market of nutrient-dense foods. And so we, we ask questions about whether the intervention is actively promoting nutrition awareness, for example, or whether it's um, looking to ways to, to uh, stress the importance of uh, using some of the increased income from the intervention to improving nutritional status of the household. But the, uh, and of course, you know, they're, they're familiar to you all. If I think of the, uh, the World Bank's uh, Pathways from Agriculture and Nutrition, the 2007 report, then this is two of th these are two of the five pathways. There's nothing new here. Um, Although it's important to establish, you know, I'm not saying that, 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 that they may not be new, but it's still important. Um, and third, we have what we call the post farm gate pathway. That's to say we're interested in how food moves off the farm and whether there's anything agricultural interventions can do to ensure that if a farm is, if, if an agricultural intervention increases the production of nutrient dense foods, whether any of that food goes to households that are deficient in nutrients, uh, are nutritionally deficient in some way. And uh, one of the things we found when we were trialling in Bangladesh is that lots of uh, households were increasing their production of fish and they were increasing their sales of fish. Uh, nobody seemed to be very clear who was buying that fish, although the assumption was that most of it was going to the big cities. People were complaining bitterly about the price of fish. And, um, and so uh, we, we felt that as the food moved off the farm, then any potential for using that food to solve uh, problems of undernourishment was being lost by the, uh, the, the lack of attention to be thinking about you know, how we might direct that food to the people that most need it. Although I accept that that raises a very important trade-off about incomes versus the, nutrition, the incomes of the beneficiary households against the... Um, uh, the nutritional benefits to um, post farm gate households. So we call that the post farm gate pathway. The reason for that is that the, the post farm gate may be to another farm, so it's not off farm or non farm. It may be, it may be to uh, how the food goes to other farms that are not beneficiaries of the program. So um, people work, uh, people pass through the tool according to a series of filters. So, for example, if, some, if uh, somebody answers a question which says, does this agricultural intervention um, increase the production of nutrient-dense foods? The answer might be no. The answer might be no, this agricultural intervention is concerned with increasing the production of maize for animal feed. Or this intervention is concerned with increasing the production of prawns, 99% of which are exported. Right, perfectly legitimate. I mean, I'm not saying that one can't have increased maize production or increased um, production of um, seafood or fish uh, that, that is exported. But in that case, the respondents would then go straight to the income pathway and we wouldn't be looking at on-farm consumption or looking at post-farm gate distribution channels about who gets to that food. So according to how you answer the filtering questions, your route or uh, route through the uh, um, the, uh, the tool uh, varies and so you, you, some people answer some questions, some people answer others, um, some people do a lot of questions, other people do relatively few. Now, so the shape of the tool then is that we start off by asking about the basic characteristics of the intervention. We then filter according to whether the intervention produces nutrient dense foods <coughs> or increases <coughs> on farm pr consumption of production and consumption of, uh, of nutrient-dense foods. If the answer to that question is yes, then we look at the on-farm consumption pathway and the factors that the, how the intervention is using 
promoting on-farm consumption of these foods, and then we look at the post-farm gate pathway in sections four and five. If the answer to question two, uh, the, 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 the questions in part two is, is no, then they go straight to the post. They, sorry, they, uh, they go straight to the income pathway. I think that's a mistake there. I've just uh, I think I got carried away there. Um, that should be the uh, income pathway, part six, and everybody goes through the income pathway, and then we we finish with the uh, a summary of the findings, which I'll come to in a minute. Now, although there's different sections of this tool and people pass through it in, in different ways. I think there are a number of underlying um, principles that apply across all the different sections and all the different questions. And they are, firstly, we want to question assumptions. The tool is designed to question assumptions that people make about the nutritional impact of projects. Now, in some cases, the intervention has thought, may have thought through how to improve nutrition, and we want to check to see what that thinking is. You know, what are you doing? How do you think it will benefit uh, nutrition in, in, in households on-farm or, or post-farm gate? In other cases, people may have no interest in, may not have thought, may not have um, given nutrition any consideration. And in other cases, which are equally important, uh, agricultural interventions may assume that because they're increasing the production of food and increasing, maybe increasing the production of nutrient-dense foods, that this, this is bound to have a positive impact on nutrition. I mean, more food has got to be good, hasn't it? Well, yes. Um, it does rather depend who eats it. Um, and so part of, the, you know, part of the tool is to question assumptions so that people say, oh, I thought, and now I see, uh, just to give you one example, um, we were, uh, I was interviewing somebody when we were testing the tool and they were talking about introducing um, rice for use with zinc fertilizer. And I just asked the question, and the people, the households that you're, and, and this was for on-farm, mostly for 90% would be consumed on-farm. Um, and I asked the question, okay, um, do you have any evidence that the households that are the target of this intervention are actually that people in the household are deficient in zinc? Because you know, otherwise, what would be the point? And the answer was, I assume so. Well, I don't think assuming is good enough. I think at least you have to ask the question. And, and, and the answer should be relatively easy to find. You know, it's, not, it's not rocket science, too. Uh, but I think it's that, you know, it's, that's one of the simplest and immediate kind of benefits you get from people applying the tool. They start to think themselves about what they're doing and why and, and what the outcomes might be. The second thing is um, the question of evidence. I think there's a lot of, there is a lot of emphasis in the tool about evidence. Um, and I think that we're, we're looking to, to, to ask the questions, well, if you're producing more food, what evidence do you have that if you produce more nutrient-dense food on the farm, people would be likely to eat it in the, in the farm household? What evidence do you have that um, people are deficient in the nutrients that will be supplied by this food? And so on. And so we, we want people to, uh, we're trying to push for if, people are, if interventions are concerned about the agriculture nutrition link, then we're pushing for evidence-based de uh, design of projects that will find some, some basis for answering those questions. Um, and I think also we, look for, we also look for evidence in terms of um, prompting people to consider whether they have any, uh, nutrient, uh, any uh, nutrition questions in their uh, monitoring and evaluation. And I'll give you another example of that. Project, very concerned with nutrition, uh, doing quite a lot of really interesting things, an agricultural project mainly, but it was, uh, it was concerned with nutrition awareness, it was concerned with um, trying to introduce uh, small indigenous uh, species of fish into the aquaculture program because on the assumption that <coughs> they, these fish would be more likely to be consumed by, by the household and the rest. Um, we, uh, they, they were, uh, alongside shrimp, they were introducing um, carp, again on the assumption that carp would be more likely to be produced on, uh, consumed on farm, whereas shrimp uh, would be, uh, or prawns would be 99% uh, exported. 
And uh, we asked about monitoring, and, and so then we asked about the monitoring and evaluation program, and which which items were included. And what we found was that they had uh, that they were they had very very detailed information about yields, about you know about the amount of fish produced, about the amount of fish sold, the prices, inputs. But although the intervention was em emphasising to us that they were introducing, for example, carp as a way of uh, increasing consumption within the household, that, that was, they, 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 they saw this as one of the benefits of the programme, the monitoring and evaluation had no information about how much of the carp <laughs> produced in the ponds was being consumed in the household and how much was being sold. So one of, you know, the most basic nutrition information was not in the monitoring and evaluation. So we sort of push people in, in that direction as well to think about those questions. Because we all know if you don't measure it, then, you don't, then you, don't, you don't pay much attention to it in the end, you know, in, in, the, in the final analysis day to day. So that's evidence. There were two further things that we were interested in. One was obstacles. So we're asking people about whether they have, that if one does want to, that once you work through the logic of moving from food to nutrition, um, have the, had the respondents identified um, obstacles with respect to taking, moving along from food towards nutrition and whether those um, problems have been, uh, whether any attempts, if, if problems have been identified, whether any attempts have been made to um, resolve those problems. And finally, we were interested in opportunities. So I think the tool spurs consideration of how nutrition sensitivity might be improved. So by raising issues about crop choice, for example, or nutrition awareness programs, introducing nutrition awareness programs. We're just trying to open up the, the horizon of people specialising in agriculture and developing agriculture nutrition projects to the possibility of introducing nutrition and, and identifying some of the opportunities that might be relevant for that. Um, and finally, we end up with uh, the final section of the report, section seven, after we've gone through the, the, uh, the different routes and the different pathways is that we produce in, in section seven the report generates uh, a set of results. In fact, there are, there are two ways in which people filling in the report can uh, get results from it. The first thing they can do is print out a statement with all of their questions and all of their answers. So they can then look at it and, se and, and see what they've said. And I personally find that quite interesting. I sometimes find that when I'm interviewing people, and I remember one particular experience in India a few, India a few years ago, um, where somebody says, well, what do I get out of the interview? Uh, it's a difficult question when it's the first question from a senior manager in a very large Indian company. And, and, I, and my answer to that was, if you listen to the answers you give to the questions that I ask, you might learn something. And I think that that's actually an important process. You know, the, you, you, it helps you think through, helps you reflect. And, and, and so we, we, one thing is to provide a clear set of answers and then people can consider, you know, look at, start to look at the contradictions or start to think about the things they, they, they thought they, they knew or they thought they'd resolved but in fact hadn't in practice. Secondly, the summary of results highlights areas of decisions that are made without clear evidence base. So we say, you know, you say this, or you, you're thinking this, but you don't seem to have any evidence. Why don't you go, why don't you go and find, you know, basically the message then is, why don't you go and find some evidence? Uh, in, in, and not just in general, but in particular areas. Uh, we also highlight where problems have been identified but not resolved. And in the end, I think the, the um, we hope that users of the tool who come from agricultural backgrounds might, after using the tool, consider whether they need to talk to nutrition specialists. However, I do, want to, I do really want to emphasise, and I conclude with this point, uh, I do want to emphasise that I think that the exchange between agriculture and nutrition is not one way. And therefore, I think there's a lot that nutrition people can learn from agriculture people, even though this tool is looking at a nutrition-sensitive leg lens on agricultural projects. I don't think that that's the only way in which information and interaction um, can, can be developed. And if you do want to play around with the tool, you can find it at this website. And you can, uh, it's, uh, you, you can go to the website, you can open up the tool, and then it will allow you to complete the tool offline and um, generate results. I just want to say that if you do look at it today, 
it, it will be develop, it, we, it will be a, a living tool, and so it will develop over the time. And you know that was part of the whole process of having it online in this particular format, so that we, you know, rather than the paper version, or rather than a pure offline version, we wanted to to give ourselves the opportunity for development. And so um, you, you, you get first stab, but it won't be the won't be the final version. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. So, um, I, first of all, uh, thank you for mentioning printout. That may be a generational thing, too. Um, <laughs> um, but just to let you know that the tool, the linkage to the tool appears on the GAIN website. It appears on the Secure Nutrition website. It's also on the IDS website. So um, feel free to get on there and take it for a test drive. Um, and I think that what we'll do with the remaining time um, is maybe hand it over to both Jay and Graham, just some, some first thoughts, you know, how uh, actually with USAID, uh, Jay, you have been part of this since the beginning. You've seen it in its infancy and actually has it evolved over time. Um, now it is a completely online tool, which is, you know, follows through a decision tree sort of format, and hopefully that's useful. I know that there has been some discussion, and we've already started using the tool with USAID, um, so just a few comments on how you see that maybe moving forward. And Graham, sorry to sort of, you know, throw this at you without much background, um, but if you had any words about how you might think about this, the utility of this within the World Bank. Mm. Um, then, um, but perhaps before we get to you folks, I'll open it up to the floor to ask John uh, any questions he might have. You may have on the, uh, how it functions, its functionality, whether we've made any certain considerations, whether we've, you know, how we've built it out itself. <laughs> so my first question was, oh, I'm sorry, I'm Diane DiBernardo with the Bureau for Food Security. And um, since this is designed more for non-nutrition folks, is there also a guide to help people look for the evidence base behind their assumptions? And the other question is, um, does the tool address um, gender impacts, or do you think it might be able to be adjusted for that in the future? Um, let's take a let's take a group. Any others? Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Um, can you just quickly tell us how long it takes for a project implementer to complete this, and whether after completing all the questions you get a response right away, or there's a lag time. Um, secondly, uh, one of the things that we talked about in our World Bank report on this topic was at the same time as trying to maximize the nutritional impact, minimizing unintended consequences. And I was wondering if that is part of um, the questions. Thank you. Hi, Pace Levinsky from uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, I was just interested in um, knowing whether there was also uh, a component of the tool that looks at um, uh, during the first thousand days um, nutrition um, during the first thousand days. Thank you. Okay, good. Hi, my name is Lee Dandu. I'm with the Spring Project. My question is, is on the pathways. Um, the World Bank in 2007 proposed five pathways, and IFPRI in 2012 proposed seven pathways, and there are three pathways. How are you going to synchronize the pathways and, and guide all the uh, programming? Thanks. Okay, maybe maybe we'll do a second round. Can we do a second round? So otherwise we're going to keep growing. I'll take some of the, the easier questions, John. Um, gender is built in. There are questions um, related to gender within the tool. Um, the, the management of unintended consequences, you know, by using the tool itself, it's pretty interesting what it can dig up. Uh, we found, for example, when we applied the tool and tested it on the dairy value chains in Kenya, one of the objectives was to get, um, I believe it was coolers, there were coolers that they wanted to get much closer and actually had it succeeded in improving um, the production of milk in the household large projects. Um, what we found though was that it encouraged very much the presence of those coolers to sell both morning and evening milk. 
Now the evening milk was consumed by the household. So by working through the tool, one can see where you could perhaps be actually reducing nutrition security within the household. Um, so I think it's, it's pretty valuable in, trying to, in, in digging up some of those as well. John, I'll turn the rest to you. Uh, yes, uh, well, I'll just take them in order. Um, on the evidence-based question, um, we, don't we don't say to the tool doesn't provide guidance about how you're going to find evidence. I think there is potential if the tool, uh, when the tool is adopted reasonably widely, to start to develop um, sources of evidence to use. The We're asking people to feed back to gain you know, what they think about the tool, and it might be possible, depending on resources and depending how successful the tool is, to start to build an evidence base from the people that are using the tool and, and, and uh, people reporting their experiences. You could sort of think about it as a community of practice of tool users. I mean, that has resource implications, of course, but that seems to be one way in which you could uh, develop that evidence base. As Bonnie says, um, on gender, it is in the tool. Um, we didn't want to, uh, because we, we assume that most agricultural projects have, um, you know, have a gender component or at least they're, you know, they're gender sensitive. I mean, it's hard to imagine. Well, they should. Um, we didn't want to repeat questions that we thought would be asked by other people, but since there are specific gender issues around nutrition, then there is a section on nutrition. There is a section on gender, rather, but again, it takes the format of have you done an assessment of the gender implications? Have you done an assessment of opportunities? It's those types of questions again, rather than specific questions. Uh, it's about you know, whether, whether you've considered it and, and where your evidence is coming from. How long to, uh, to answer the tool? Much shorter now. That it's electric. Yes, uh, and I think, but it, I th it really depends on the pathways. I think the, the if, if the the uh, I think it would take under an hour to to do the section, well under an hour to do the section on the income pathway. I think the section on the on-farm consumption pathway is also uh, is, is is long is is a bit longer than the income pathway, but not too long. I think the post farm gate consumption, because it implies a lot of things about how food moves off the farm and down the value chain, then that probably takes a long time. So if you did all of it, if you, did all, if you had answered all those questions, it would take a fair amount of time. But if you were, if you, uh, I, I, I think that most projects w would probably focus on the first two pathways and therefore it would take considerably shorter time. As soon as you've completed it, section seven is already filled in and then you can look at the results and print them out. So there's, there's, you don't have to wait for somebody else to respond. It's, it, it, it's there but anyway. It's not a matter of days. It's not a matter of days. It's yeah. hours. Yeah. <coughs> as long as you, you know, keep concentrating and pay attention and don't <laughs> get distracted in the middle. A thousand days. Thank you for that question because I, I think it raises some really important issues. And the issue is this. I think that... The, the, uh, the proposal is probably, could be quite important for maternal or nutrition um, and inputs. But we know that children under two are not going to get most of their nutritional requirements from unprocessed foods. It's going to be milk, it's going to be complementary foods and the rest. That's not going to come from these agricultural projects. I think if you really want to do work around food-based approaches to the thousand days, or at least, let's say, the thousand days from the point, the latter part of the thousand days, the, chi you know, the child, then I think you have to be thinking probably about complementary foods and thinking about agriculture nutrition linkages in a different way. And we started to do that. We started to develop a tool that says, what are the nutritional needs? How do we work back to agriculture to get the inputs to to, uh, to develop the products that address those needs. And I think that <coughs> the, um, I think that agriculture, thinking about here is an agricultural project, how do we increase the nutrition sensitivity? It's too, it's too broad a brush, too, uh, too in a, firstly it's not r well targeted, but secondly it's too big to, s to really address the question of the of, of child, um, nutri uh, the nutrition of children under the age of two. 
Uh, and I think there are different ways of doing that. We think that you have to reverse the argument and start from nutrition and work back to, to agriculture. Um, but I think it raises a lot of questions about markets, about about control of quality, about the signalling of quality in complementary foods. We've been doing some work recently in Ghana on this. Um, and I think you just have to adopt a different approach. So I don't think it really, don't think it, I don't think it actually addresses this problem. Um, and, uh, and I think that there, are, that there are other important ways of addressing that problem. Can I just interject? So, yeah. so the second tool is called Nutritious Agriculture by Design. The second in the series is a tool for private sector engagement. And it starts with um, products complementary foods, um, it could be a lipid-based nutrient supplement, locally produced, and then working through those value chains moving backwards and where you will have constraints um, in, in getting sufficient supply, adequate and safe supply for those products in, in your target countries. Stay tuned. That should be within the year. And on the final question about the pathways. Yes, I'm sorry about pathway proliferation. Um, <laughs> However, if you think about the World Bank Five Pathways, two of those are very generic. It's that growth and increased incomes should have some benefits. An increased production should reduce the prices. Um, so they're, they're pretty generic. You know, they're big macro effects. And we have the problem that you know, uh, you know, we don't know whether the undernourished people, are going, you know, how much they will benefit if we're reducing prices of products that they don't generally buy, can't afford, or aren't available to them. Um, and I think our third pathway is something different because what we're really saying is that the, the issue of food availability is not defined in terms of the, a macro question of is there enough food in society to meet nutritional needs. It's, it's defined at the micro level. Do people who don't have a, uh, um, a sufficiently balanced diet to contribute towards their nutritional well-being, are products available for them to buy? So that is physically, can, are, they are the products put close enough for them to buy? Is it affordable? Is it acceptable? Does it have good nutritional quality? And I think that very <coughs> thinking about the problem of nutrition, not in terms of the macro, what's the total amount of nutritious, nutrient dense food available to people, but do the specific populations who are undernourished, do, are they able to, f to find this food and to purchase it and to find it acceptable to eat? I think that, that, that's, um, that that's something which I don't think is refle it's reflected. It's uh, reflected. I, mean, I suppose we, we developed some of these ideas in parallel with uh, the people at the uh, El Saira, the London Liebichum Centre for mm, something it. in something in health um, <laughs> in London. And uh, 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 people like... Um, the name's gone out of my head now. Jeff Waggy. Yeah, Waggy and what's the... Uh, Jill Hawkes. Mm. And so... Corinna, you know, Corinna. Corinna Hawkes, sorry, yes. And, uh, and, and uh, yes, that's right. Yeah, I, sorry, I'm bad on names. I'd better not say any more. Um, but, uh, you know, so we, you know though, I think that that type of approach towards the specificity of, uh, of, new, uh, of food availability is something that, um, you know, it re is reflected in the... In the uh, in, in the post farm gate uh, nutrition route. So, so, so we have 10 minutes, and I might want to now just turn to both Jay and Graham for a few comments. Um, Jay, you obviously have, have seen this tool, and particularly where you're coming from, you know, you're coming from the Bureau of Food Security, mm -hmm. you understand the private sector piece to it. Um, you know, so I guess I would add to not only your observations about the tool, but if we were to make the private sector appreciate more of these opportunities and benefits available to them along the whole agricultural value chain. Um, you know, what's the best way to do it? It's, it's a pretty tricky business trying to align um, the incentives for um, private sector engagement with um, public health and nutrition and, um, you know, whether you expand market share or you reduce costs seems to be what the private sector needs to do, although it is a changing environment. So if you can comment on both of those, sure. that would be great. Um, USAID has been focusing on agriculture, agricultural product productivity for decades. It reached its peak in the 1970s and started a, a three-decade decline, um, largely as a result of the food shocks. I'm just giving some background as to why AID is, is involved with, with this project um, and Feed the Future, <coughs> largely as a result of the food shocks of the last decade. Um, at, the 19, at the 2009 L'Aquila Summit, President Obama and other uh, world leaders convened to reverse the three-decade decline in, in agriculture 
agriculture investment and to commit to putting food security and nutrition high on the, the development agenda again. Uh, the Bureau for Food Security at USAID was established to support Feed the Future, which is the U.S. government's uh, global food security and um, global hunger and food security initiative. Um, USAID is the is the main implementing agency, but it is a U.S. government-wide initiative. Um, we'd seen that as uh, yields and agriculture yields and agricultural product productivity increase, we haven't seen a corresponding increase in the nutritional content of our crops, and the evidence suggests that a lot of it, um, a lot of the nutritional content has actually declined. So that's sort of the situation we found ourselves in when we established Feed the Future in the Bureau of Food Security. Uh, the Global Health Bureau at USAID has been supporting gain since shortly after its inception, inception, but now that um, the Bureau for Food Security was established and Feed the Future was, was being <coughs> implemented, we saw an opportunity to work with GAIN to, um, to really address the linkages between agriculture and nutrition. Um, we tested this tool, which is really, I think, the first in a, a, a long relationship together to, to bridge the gap, um, in Kenya, Bangladesh, and Mozambique. And the, the reaction that we got from our mission staff and from USAID staff, both from the testing and then from some global workshops where we rolled it out in uh, Bangkok, Guatemala, and Uganda, was um, they were very receptive to the fact that the tool uses the agriculture value chain as its framework. Um, there was a, it wasn't a new a new method of looking at things, a new layer to be added on top of anything. It used the, it used the framework and used the environment that they're comfortable in working in. So that was very, <coughs> very well received. Um, the other that was that it does not, o it cannot, it's not only used for new projects. Uh, John had said in his presentation that it is ideal if it is a new project, but a lot of our agriculture interventions are multi-year projects. Um, that, <laughs> that are around for a while. So it was also very, it was noted and very well received that it can be used to apply a nutritional lens to existing agricultural products. Um, and then you know, finally, from our perspective, um, as we did fund the development of the tool, it is not just for USAID projects. It is a public good, um, really for anyone in the donor community that is, that is um, seeking to add a nutritional lens to the agriculture interventions. Um, in terms of the private sector, it is Private sector engagement is a core component of Feed the Future. Um, we see private sector engagement and engagement with our private sector partners, not just as a resource donor, but truly a strategic partner from whom we can leverage their expertise, their market access, their, their, um, their presence in the country um, to create win-win partnerships that both um, meet our development objectives and obviously the development objectives of the countries that we work in, but also to improve the sustainability of, of the collaboration that address a core business need of the company. Um, with that in mind, the language of the private sector is profits. And I think that a way to really bring the private sector involved in linking agriculture and nutrition is to really firmly establish a, profit a profitability link that I don't see, that I haven't really seen yet. Um, I think that it would be really incumbent upon the donor community and the public sector to gather the evidence base and do a lot more research on the market analysis of linking profitability to, um, to value chains and at the income level of the vulnerable populations. Graham. Mm. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I apologize. I've flown in from Swaziland last night, so I didn't have quite as much time and, and probably not quite as much sleep as I should have. Um, but I just wanted to um, say a few things. I mean, one, one is that I suspect that the World Bank's approach to project design is quite different from USAID. Um, we, we are a bank. We loan money to people, and they implement it. Um, so it's not as if we design a project. We work with our clients to design a project. If you go into a World Bank design mission team, you will see small groups of people, two or three from the government, some expert having an interactive discussion. They will be talking about what works here, what works there, and so on and so forth. So we need to see it in, in that kind of context. Um, the second thing is that we have at least three points in the design of every one of our projects where we put in quality assurance. In other words, we have external peer reviewing at the project concept note stage, at the quality enhancement review, and before anything. So a lot of those kind of things that might be missed are caught then when somebody points out that you've forgotten this and where's the evidence for that. Um, 
what uh, and, and it is an enormously complex process because you have to bear in mind so many different things that are very specific to that particular country, the capacity, the consumption demands, the diets, the institutions that are available, the funding, the location. Um, so what I, what I did was that I then went to your tool and applied it to one of our projects. A uh, project in we, we do use zinc on, on um, rice and, and the reason we use zinc is not particularly because of a nutrition deficiency, but there's a nutrition deficiency in the, in the rice mm -hmm. which added to it. So that there, there are arguments why we did. Um, and what the first thing that jolted me was that I could only apply one enterprise at a time. In, in this project we've got rice, we've got milk, we've got fish, we've got vegetables. Mm -hmm. And so then I was a kind of bit stymied as to what was the process on doing that. Um, I found that some of the language um, was not things that I, I mean I wasn't you know I, I apologize for my ignorance I wasn't quite sure what you defined as a nutrient dense food I mean, in Mozambique um, vegetable oil is considered to be something which is really important so I wasn't quite sure of what the terms were there um, and, and I, I also I should add that I'm a bit of a skeptic about um, expert systems having seen that they kind of push you in directions that if you freelance you will come to a different solution um, but then when I got to the end what did I, what did I take away from it what I found was that it reminded me about things I might easily have forgotten and occasionally it would nudge me to do things that I hadn't thought about. Um, what it didn't tell me um, was anything about delivery, um, about what works. Um, uh, uh, um, so if I was thinking about how would I apply that if I was a task team leader on a project going into a situation where we're trying to tie nutrition and um, agriculture. I mean I would always have in my team a new nutritionist and, he, and they wouldn't be an expert. I don't want somebody from Spain applying the methodology in Swaziland. I want somebody who knows how things are working in seven or eight different countries and can be able to do a cut and paste and say we have a bit of this and a bit of that. So that person would inevitably be in my team in, in, from the outset. Um, but I would ask them that that team of the local government staff and the nutritional expert would use your tool to go through it because I think it will nudge their thinking process and it helps organize your, your structuring your thinking. Um, and I would probably go through it quickly myself so when I had a discussion with them I, I knew the questions to ask. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you Graham. John, I, I think these are great observations on the tool, I mean certainly as we were finding it, um, but it, what you're hitting on is where what our first goal was. It's mm. to really sort of get agriculturalists to think and inquire mm. and find opportunity to begin to incorporate. Um, but that said, the way it's developed, uh, you know, one can add modules mm. um, to it. And, and so I think these are great comments. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, John. No, I think, uh, I think that's very interesting. Uh, I don't think we found a way around the issue of one commodity at a time, because yeah. I, and, and I know that we, we came across uh, projects where you know, they were bringing together rice and maize and, and mm. fish and, and uh, seafood, and um, but I, th I think I, I think we'd have to uh, I think if you go through it one by one, then certainly you can pick up the nutrient benefits from one product, and you can also pick up the what I would call the complementary initiatives like Homestead Gardens and the rest, we've deliberately made sure that where you, for example, you've got a, got a rice project, but you've also got a nutrition awareness project, you've got um, uh, Homestead Gardens, that kind of thing, then the, the tool does enable you to look at those types of multiple interventions. But you ca uh, I, I guess the question is, the real question that we have to answer is, if a project has particularly in the same household, more than one crop. Uh, completing the tools separately for each of them rather than doing in some way finding a way of doing it all together, whether that actually takes uh, insights away or not. And I just don't know whether mm -hmm. doing, d doing each, each one separately may be, may be a little bit more time consuming, whether it's actually detrimental in terms of the findings. Mm -hmm. It's really <coughs> hard to say until you've <coughs> tested it a lot more in the field. Okay, we can open it back up. Any questions? Please line up. My name is Lad. I'm the Senior Director for Nutrition at ACDI VOCA. Um, I, I think you guys have done 
I mean, cause I was in the beta testing of the first tool and have, you know, kind of looked at it and reviewed it um, over the last couple of years. But I think one of the biggest challenges is, you know, a lot of the Feed the Future projects, 50, probably I'm guessing at least what we're getting 50% or more are looking higher up in the value chain than the farm gate. And so then my challenge is, how do you then use this when, you know, they're saying you've got to reach over a million farmers, which obviously you're not going to do farm gate to farm gate. You know, you're doing that through farmer cooperative unions or other kinds of things. And so how can you apply this tool either higher up, you know, in that situation or maybe you're only working in private sector, maybe you're only working in export and does this tool apply there or are you only <coughs> limiting it to the farm gate? My question, uh, is this on? Yeah. Ann Henderson Siegel with ICF at their Center for Design and Research and Sustainability. Thank you for sharing this with us today and for all the comments and presentations. Very helpful. Um, looking, it looks like you've done a good job with the comprehensiveness, and I'm not got into it myself, but this operational ability, the same question, following along the same line is, you know, is this a new project, but we are looking at joint planning, joint efforts, local ownership. So, you know, as you rolled it out at a district level, provincial level, and national level, um, using this tool and it's electronic is the idea is someone goes and does this and then presents the information to the group with the printout and they apply it for planning or just getting a little bit more insight into how it operationalizes, especially with integrated joint planning um, and at the various levels uh, where you found the most uh, light bulbs come on or the most use or the most energy around it. Hi, Liz Buckingham from the Office of Global Food Security at the um, Department of State. Two, three quick questions. Um, logistically, are you able to stop and start the tool? Like if you're not able to do it in one sitting, are you able to save what you're doing, come back to it and finish? Is it in available in multiple languages or just in English? And also in terms of, uh, are you all able to track what people are finding? So are you able to kind of see um, the tool and the results and the outcomes, also who's using it, so you can kind of track those demographics. Uh, I'm Avril Armstrong from uh, Land of Lakes, and I was going to make my question complicated. I just, I'm going to simplify it. Where did the nutritionists come in? Because as I listened to this presentation, um, Mr. Dixie touched on, or Dr. Dixie touched on it a little bit from his perspective, where he's, you know, he said he would hire someone that's you know, has nutrition expertise, and we talked, you know, Mr. Hum Dr. Humphrey talked about the unidirectional arrow, but to me it seems like it's quite unidirectional, and I'm not so convinced, maybe once I use the tool, that where we would use it, and if an agricultural person who hasn't been working with nutritionists or in nutrition picks this tool up, will they understand impact and the evidence and where to go to look for the evidence, and, you know, will they just say, okay, well, We'll try and make a go of it on our own. And it would have been nice to see what the printouts look like, what the final, you know, what the final summary would be. What, what do we do? What comes out of this? So that's my question. Thanks. Should we do? Do you want one more? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Do you want okay. Uh, thank you for those questions. Um, lots of food for thought. Um, I think with regard to, uh, if I understood the first question, um, the first question. Um, about the, the about beyond the farm gate, I think, uh, and you were saying that in interventions have involved many farmers. I think that, I think the tool can be. Uh, I think the tool explores the logic of how you think food moves from agriculture to nutrition. And so I think I, I don't see why uh, it, it can't be used to look at any any project that is really trying to say we want to make a difference to food production. How do we follow that through to? Um, uh, to improvements in nutrition. So maybe if I haven't quite understood the question. You're not necessarily working directly with the farmers. You're working higher up. Yeah, okay. But I think that, that when you're working higher up, in the end, you have to make a difference at the farm level. So you have to say, you must have a theory of change which says this intervention will do this, that, it, that will cause that, and that will change something at the farm level. And if you say, well, um, and then you ask the question, well, will that change at the farm level or will interventions at a higher level actually do anything to, to, to do the nutrition? So I think, it is, I think you can work through the theory. Um, I, I think it, it, it should be possible to work that through, I hope. Um, on the question of, uh, there are some, uh, and, and there are more questions about operationalization. 
What we did in, in Tanzania was to get together 20 or 30 people in a two or three day workshop and work through the tool together and I think that that type of training and that type of group work might be one of the most effective ways to use the tool. And uh, although we offer it as a, a standalone and anybody can use it, I think that people learning together, people learning from different projects, learning how, you know, or, 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 or comparing, uh, you know, a, a same approach, the same project, but in, in different areas, <coughs> different parts of the country, different, where there are different challenges, might be a very, very useful learning experience. And so I think that <coughs> we, we would hope that, right, that we, although we put it online and anybody can use it and availability is one of the strong points. I think there are, there, there are a variety of ways in which it can be operationalized and, and so it could be used by, uh, could be used by people working in, in, in the, the same discipline in the same country, it could be used by uh, task groups involving people from different uh, organizations and so on. So I think there's lots of ways in which the, the tool can be used. Um, yes, it is only in English. Um, if anybody wants to pay for a multi, uh, multi-linguistic uh, capability, I, I don't think we would uh, say no. Um, but there are an awful lot of languages in the world, and one has to sort of... Uh, I'm sure the French would be very angry if it didn't... if it, that wasn't the second choice. Uh, so that's a very European comment, sorry. Um, um, with regard to uh, tracking, yes, you can start the tool, stop, go back, take it up again at a subsequent stage. You can go back and change your answers and then carry on. Although since some of those answers will have implications for how you move through the tool, you might find that you, you have to start filling in similar areas of the tool because you've, you've changed your answers and the routing starts to change. Um, in an ideal world, all agricultural projects will be working with nutritionists. And nutritionists would, insofar as it's relevant, that's to say it's to do with food-based initiatives, uh, food-based approaches to undernutrition, might be working with agricultural people. Just in practice, that doesn't seem to be happening anywhere near as much as it should. And therefore, we're just trying to start to, to bridge the gap. And, um, and so uh, I hope that through using the tool and particularly if you start to use it you know with these workshops or, or training sessions then you can start to bring agriculture and nutrition people together more effectively we certainly saw that when we were trialing it uh, that that people who haven't talked together so much were starting to talk together that they realized that oh i really ought to you know what are they doing you know the, the first question you know, i'm doing my stuff but, you know, and, and it's quite easy to you know, silo yourself off. But, uh, and, and so I think that, you know, the first thing is, is this, is it better that agriculturalists on their own think about nutrition rather than not thinking about nutrition? Probably. Would it be better if they start to talk to nutritionists about nutrition in agricultural projects? Yes. It, it, would it be better if nutritionists start to talk more with agriculture people? Yes. So it's a question about spurring some of those linkages. But it's such a deep-seated problem. But, um, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I'm not saying this tool is, the, is certainly not going to be the answer to it all. I just, I just want to add one thing about the summary. Um, gain, there's a possibility at the end that you oh, resubmit yes. these, um, the findings to gain, um, and in which case we can do analysis across um, all the submissions. Um, it's not obligatory, uh, but it is something that we've built in. Um, just, just to add power to the comment by ACI Boko, when we do the numbers about where the increased demand of food is going to be, it is the urban market. And, and the urban poor is huge as far as we're concerned. So thinking about there how we're going to deliver nutrient-rich food to an urban market with changing eating patterns eating and, and consumption patterns and, and um, economics um, is, is going to be a fundamental issue in the future. Agreed. Why, why, that's why we didn't just do on-farm consumption, that there are other pathways. Is that well, I was going to say that. I mean, I, I was uh, just looking idly yesterday, as one does, at um, nutrition figures for Nigeria. And it seemed to show that, um, that the rates of stunting in urban areas were not that much lower than in rural areas. They were, they, they were shocking. For me, anyway, they were quite shockingly high. And so this urban issue is, 
is a big one. And I think that as soon as you think about these post farm gate populations, you might be you know, people living in rural areas or urban areas, then you have a different set of challenges about how that food is going to be delivered close enough and in, 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 a, in, a, pack, in, a, in a format and at a price that uh, they, they can afford with some guarantee. If, you know, and if the price is a little bit higher than less nutritious food, how do you, how do you signal that that food is worth paying for you know when you know there's plenty of uh, scope for opportunism in the market and i think that our second tool and some of our thinking around that starting in a sense with saying what are the products that people in urban areas might find affordable and acceptable and then working backwards towards agriculture that again is the way that's the you know our, our second tool is sort of turning things around and starting from that approach because i think that we have to find you know products that are profitable to, to deliver, but also suitable and affordable to, to the target populations. And, and, and I think that, you know, urban undernutrition is, as you rightly, I mean, a lot of people, you know, more and more people live in urban areas and some proportion of those are undernourished and, and in some countries quite a substantial proportion of them. So, you know, looking to use the tool, uh, looking to develop tools that would be appropriate to that. I think we find, you know, this, this where the poor are sourcing their foods is a huge question. What are they eating and where are they getting it? Um, certainly the value chain is quite short if it's on farm consumption and the more you move to urban areas the longer it gets and that creates many more opportunities for um, improving the nutritional density of those foods but it also creates problems as we know with food safety um, but this whole idea that you source on the farm you can source in local markets you can source in large formal markets and then you know there's always public food distribution systems um, and how one works again from the product backwards to ensure that those foods moving into all four of those markets is, are, is um, both, you know, adequate and from a nutrition standpoint and safe and sustainable. But I think Bonnie, you were saying to me today that uh, the study you've done in Kenya on complementary foods in rural areas that even in rural areas a lot of food is purchased by women on the market, and so the it's, you know, rural areas aren't reliant on on-farm consumption. So this market question and post-farm gate questions are really important in rural areas as well as for urban consumers. Particularly with seasonality, mm. um, you know, there's certain times of the year where you're going to get a nice basket of food. It's still questionable whether that will reach adequacy for the under twos, uh, but the fact is that moms are using markets. Uh, and they're using markets particularly for these foods for kids, for the little ones, because they're not going to have their food, their half hectare, be just for complementary foods. Uh, so it, 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 does, it does have you look at the quandary being that when you get to the market, the, for, the fortified complementary foods are unaffordable. Uh, and there should be, from our perspective, at least from this study, there needs to be a real push to try to bring affordable complementary foods to markets as moms are using those. Oh, yes, yeah, sure, please. We have um, probably about 10, 15 minutes if we want to fill the time. Kathleen Kurz from, um, from DAI Development Alternatives. Um, the urban, um, the urban poor, um, I think, is a really big issue. I think some of our, what we're finding in implementing some of the Feed the Future projects is that the, the, the goal is getting food, getting the surplus food to feed the urban market but the beneficiaries that we're following are still in the rural areas which is beneficial but we're missing a lot of the benefits of the projects because we're not we're not measuring we're not mandated to measure in the urban area and I thought of this also when you mentioned your th your third pathway there this is a variation on your third pathway so we may want to this is not particularly about the tool I don't know if it fits or not but think about picking up the additional beneficiaries in the um, in the urban markets and I think that would open up a lot of different ways of thinking about um, how we're improving nutrition from the agriculture project if we knew you know how much dietary diversity there's more chance probably for dietary diversity in urban areas um, and so how, how would we affect that um, and um, how much is actually happening Hi, I'm, I'm Catherine Kreis from um, Gain, and despite the fact that I work about two offices away from Bonnie, I, I don't get to see her very often, so this is a great chance to um, have her pinned down. Um, I, I have a couple of, of questions that are sort of all interrelated and, and really are around the enabling environment, and I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on anything that you're doing related to 
uh, the kind of demand side and also thinking about um, the policy regulatory environment or the legislation and regulatory environment. And then my third question sort of harkens back to something that Graham said and he sort of, how do you know what a nutritious food is? I think for this for this tool, it's not so important, but I would suspect that for your private sector tool, it is going to be an issue. And and I, I think one of the growing issues that we're going to face as a community is that uh, a non-nutritious food, the definition of that is going to grow to expand to be something that's not only related to improved nutritional quality related to undernutrition, but increasingly um, how those products look like in an obesity and increasingly obesogenic uh, environment and world. And so I'm wondering if you might be able to, to comment on those. Thanks. My name is Eugenie Zumenu. I'm from UMES, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, a nutritionist. So my question is about the pathway. Uh, when we consider the NGOs in the private sector, usually when they choose the food that they want to write a project on, it's based on the commodity, like the government commodities. So how this tool will help in this case, and what will be the basic question that they have to ask to be able to use the tool, because the, the food that they are choosing is not, they are not free to choose the food. They have to follow the government commodities. That's my question. Hi, my name is Liza Douglas. I'm with Plan, Plan International USA. Um, my question is about the how and the practices. There's been a couple sprinkled mentions of, of how, but um, I was just thinking of a project we did where we were promoting soy for women farmers. And, you know, the agriculture team said, and by the way, the moms will start eating it too. And, <laughs> and we're like, okay, well, how are you going to do that? Well, we'll just, you know, put up a sign or something that says eat more soy. You know, it, you know, the idea of how you actually promote the uptake and consumption, I don't know if that's part of the tool. Is the tool just saying, have you thought about how you're going to promote it, yes or no? And if they say, yes, we're going to make a sign, you know, is, is that enough? Or is there something in there about what best practices are or how to find where those best practices are and how to actually promote the good ones. Thanks. Why don't you start? Um, I have some responses to the pathways question and Catherine's, some of Catherine's stuff. Sorry, uh, on uh, urban beneficiaries and uh, looking at beyond the farm, looking beyond the farm when we're thinking about who benefits from agricultural projects, um, I think it'd be nice to do that. I just don't know whether agricultural projects, generally speaking, are, are too farm focused to do it. What one generally finds is that they move beyond the farm if they're concerned with marketing, but that the the the, the the, uh, the, a lot of the focus is going to be at the farm level about driving increases in yields and uh, productivity and the rest. And so, um, and, and on the input side, not so much on, on the output side. So one of the questions is, if you want to find out more about what's going on post farm gate, whether that should be done by the project or it should be done by somebody else. You know, what's the division of labour in terms of identifying impacts or identifying, you know, post farm gate um, value chains? And, and I think that's an issue that we need to, that we all need to to consider. Um, with regard to uh, food, the, the, the question on uh, food choice, yes, you may not be free to choose the food, but once you have the, once you've got a particular crop or commodity to, uh, that you've adopted, then you can ask the question, you know, if it's not a, for example, a nutrient dense food, however we, we define that, then you can still say, well, let's, let's explore the income pathway and see what we can do to promote the, uh, some increased consumption of nutrient uh, dense foods bought on the market within the household so you can do that so really the 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 choice of crop is going to determine what pathways are open to you but you can still explore one or more of those pathways you know even if your crop choice is constrained but you might also then go back at some point and say well if if we produced you know other things if you had an other things being equal situation and said, this crop or this crop, let's choose the one with greater nutrient value because it opens up these possibilities. Um, and uh, so, so you can start to, to push back with, uh, with that kind of information. Uh, on the, um, I'm just being very selective here, Bonnie. Uh, on on the, uh, the soy practices, yes, 
um, and in a sense, what the, what the questionnaire would say is, what, if, you, if you did this, uh, if, you, if you applied the, uh, the tool rather to in this particular project, uh, you'd have a question which would say, um, do you have any evidence that if more of this food was available, people in the household would consume it? And presumably the person would say, yes. And then you say, what is that evidence? And then you have to ask the question, well, you say put up a sign. Do you have any evidence that putting up a sign is likely to... And then you start to say, well, to, and then at the end it'll say, look, you don't have any evidence, I think you better go and find some. Now, it's true that we're not then saying, and this is the best place to find the evidence. I think the reason for that is, firstly, the evidence base is changing all the time. And secondly, um, there are so many different possible bits of... Um, assumption and, uh, and uh, optimism about, you know, that exist in projects that, um, you know, misplaced optimism, uh, that uh, it's difficult for us to specify in advance what precisely what all of those um, uh, sources of information would be, but at least we're then raising the question. And then you can go back and say, look, if you can't come up with a, a convincing explanation of uh, any, any evidence from elsewhere that this actually works, then we're not very convinced. Or you, know, the, or you might be able to say, look, I've, I've found some evidence from other projects that shows this, this is not the way to do it. And, and I think that, so it, at least it starts a conversation and it provides you with a basis for saying, look, you've got to be more stringent. You've got to provide more convincing evidence than, than, than hoping that if you tell people to eat soy, they will, because we know that, that, you know, we know that that's uh, not the case. Um, I'm going to stop there, Bonnie. Can you deal with the, uh, I think, the ones I'd like you to deal with? That's not fair, John. I mean, cherry-picking is not Policy fair. and regulatory environment and, and the demand side, and how do we know what a nutritious food okay. is? Um, Sorry, can you yeah. turn off your... So, so the demand side, I think, is really important. And I, um, you know, I think it's often missing. I came from the CGIAR prior to this, you know, many, many years at the CGIAR, which is um, very supply side. Uh, and this whole demand side and using markets is very important. Again, we've started um, something we're calling the Marketplace for Nutritious Foods, which is an engine uh, that uh, very much um, is targeted at small and medium-scale enterprises in target countries whereby we not only provide a forum for the enterprises to interface with government through seminars, training opportunities, but in the middle of that is a, is a granting mechanism. Um, and with that, we screen concepts for um, nutritional adequacy of <coughs> products that are being brought to market, um, with, for agricultural local production of input, for business for, for business uh, health and, um, and profitability, uh, and at which point in time we then as give an award of marketable business plans for these small and medium scale enterprises. Um, we're finding that's a huge constraint, is being able to get funding at the $20,000 kind of level. Um, and oftentimes these small enterprises, medium scale enterprises, just don't have um, a real good analysis of whether their products will be um, viable on the market. So we provide that service and then provide grants as well. Um, so this whole demand side has to be um, tweaked a bit more, particularly if you're trying to move nutritious foods into markets. And, you know, again, as you know, Catherine, I don't need to tell you, but we very much believe that both sustainability and reach will come through getting things into the markets. Um, so, that's, so, so that's something we push. I'd like to go back to this evidence-based question, though, because it keeps coming up. Um, John will know very well, I was, as we were developing this tool, I was pushing back on all of these many, many layers of asking for the evidence base, um, because I was, I was fearful that the designers would say, we don't have the evidence, therefore we don't have to pay attention to agriculture and nutrition. And we all know that we don't have this evidence base yet for agriculture and its contribution to nutrition. So um, what I'm hearing from this group is if in an, as the document, as this tool grows, either by ourselves or by you, um, an opportunity to gather the evidence base and best practices through the use of the tool would be actually quite a good resource to have. Um, but I do want to emphasize that the absence of evidence isn't the evidence of absence, right? We don't, we just haven't done it. It's not that it doesn't work, okay? And I think a lot of people misinterpret. Um, some of the papers that have come out on this topic. Um, and so I, my question back to my panelists, and I think it is, is um, and maybe Graham, you folks have been really struggling with this also, is where do you hold the bar? I mean, you know, for agricultural interventions, you know, one would normally, in the world of nutrition, have to go all the way to efficacy and effectiveness of an agricultural nutrition in order to call it a nutrition intervention. 
Uh, and, you know, that's a bar that may be too high for agriculture. So where do we hold the bar? And Omar, I know you've thought about this as well, and it's, it's, it's a tough one as we try to bring to through these sectors. So I'm, I'm throwing that out there as kind of as, a, as an outlier question to the group, and I know many of you in the audience would be able to chime in on that also. Um, I, I would say to John that, that it's certainly in the way that we're thinking in the bank, you have to think about the market. We, we have a pretty good sense of where the market's changing, where the open market's changing with some of these economic and uh, uh, income elasticities calculations and so on. Um, and there is that movement. You can see it happening with animal proteins, processed products, and um, increased uh, for the high value crops, starting with vegetables and then shifting into to vegetables. But you have to be able to deliver that cost effectively and so cr transaction costs and how it, everybody in that supply chain needs to be able to make a profit out of it. The questions in my mind is how, do, how are there effective tools for controlling people's sort of insatiable demand for fats, salts and, and um, uh, sugar? And, and the, um, the other question that comes up is, is when I compare the unit costs of changing people's um, consumption patterns of the private sector compared with kind of government sector, um, they're massively different. And are we, do we know how we can use some of their tools to be much more cost effective? Because what I see, my sense is that a lot of the nutrition work is very boutique. It's very kind of something that you can do on a tiny scale, but actually operating at real scale, we have to do it much, much cheaper. And I, and I don't know, do we have evidence around what works? If I could just add one more. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that a bit in terms of the what is nutritious food. Um, from a private sector standpoint, we also need to understand what the market is and what people are willing to buy as well. And I just kind of following up on my earlier comments, I don't think that the evidence base is there yet and the market research has been done, um, again, linking profitability, profitability with, with a nutritious food that's within the, 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 the price point of the vulnerable population. And one, I think one of the reasons AID is interested in this project is um, a, a lot of our work and my work in my bureau is focusing on buying down the risk involved in getting the, pro the private sector involved in projects like this. So we're very excited to go forward with that. Yeah, great. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I just wanted to add that so <coughs> when you ask the question, what are people willing to buy? That varies according to the degree of confidence that people have about what they know they're buying and because nutritious food is basically a credence good in most cases it's quite difficult to know even after consumption whether or not it's nutritious the whole issue of consumer confidence um, you know, people, people will make false claims and they do it all the time. They do it in, you know, I'm sure they do it in the USA. They certainly do it in the UK. They make false claims about food. It's very difficult for consumers to, uh, to know whether those claims are true or not. How can you tell how many vitamins there are in a, in a weenie mix? You just, you know, it's not possible to do that. And, and therefore, I think when we're thinking about markets, we have to be thinking about different strategies for increasing the reliability or the confidence that people have in the food that they're purchasing. And that might be, for example, if you think about the health sector, that might be through social franchising in the informal sector. It might be through improved regulation in the formal sector. It might be through uh, private certification schemes. You know, so any way that you can establish a brand at reasonable cost. Or, an, or identify food that, is, you know, that people are assured is good without increasing the cost too much. I mean, that's a really big challenge. And I think we, there are different types of markets, you know, informal sector, formal sector, um, large firms, small firms, different types of markets actually create different value chain um, challenges for um, reaching that particular outcome. So you have to tailor different, challenge, different strategies for, for different markets. So I've been working on the health sector and how we do something about um, you know, informal pharmacies. And many of the issues that people raise in terms of the health sector apply very, very, in very similar circumstances to nutritious food because it's, it's a product that it, it, it's a credence good and therefore the, the, the problem that consumers have of knowing, you know, do I spend money on a product that I don't even know is any good? That's, you know, that's also a big challenge. Thanks, everyone. It's 2 o'clock. Thank you for coming.